This is an introduction to Ralph Waldo Emerson's Woods, a prose sonnet by Michael Elliott at the University of Calgary. This is a sonnet whose very title is a paradox, or if you prefer, it's a tension, depending on how you feel about the validity of his form. The very conjunction of his two terms, prose and sonnet, is provocative. Can there be a sonnet in prose? Readers are a lot more accustomed to sonnets as conventional 14-line structures. And we recognize that they might have different lengths, but we are ill-prepared to extend the definition of this poetic type any further to think of sonnets as a genre. The very idea feels like an overreach. It's really difficult for us to imagine a generic definition that would encompass all of the varieties of subjects, of stories, of points of view, of tones and registers, and all the other components that would make the definition of a genre. What Emerson offers us here is a prose poem which is a poetic type that's characterized by its brevity and its compactness, but also its cohesion, its singular focus on one subject, its language patterns, its rhythms, and its repetitions. Stéphane Mallarmé, the 19th century inventor of prose poems, said, quote, There is alphabet. And then there are verses which are more or less closely knit, more or less diffuse. So long as there is a straining towards style, there is versification. And this suggests that the rhythm that defines prose poems is present in all prose. Let's read Emerson's prose poem then to witness its rhythms and to consider what qualities would make it a sonnet. Wise are ye, O ancient woods, wiser than man. Whoso goeth in your paths, or into your thickets where no paths are, readeth the same cheerful lesson whether he be a young child or a hundred years old. Comes he in good fortune or bad, ye say the same things, and from age to age. Ever the needles of the pine grow and fall, the acorns on the oak, the maples redden in autumn, and at all times of the year the ground pine and the perola bud and root underfoot. What is called fortune, and what is called time by men, ye know them not. Men have not language to describe one moment of your eternal life, This I would ask of you, O sacred woods, when ye shall next give me somewhat to say, give me also the tune wherein to say it. Give me a tune of your own, like your winds, or rains, or brooks, or birds. For the songs of men grow old when they have been often repeated, but yours though a man have heard them for seventy years, are never the same, but always new, like time itself, or like love. Emerson begins with an apostrophe, an address to the woods that he sustains all the way through. This is signaled by his use of words like ye, your, your, ye, ye, your, you, ye, your, and yours, each referring directly again to the woods that he's addressing. He also sets up right from the opening sentence a tension between the sensibilities of men and those of nature. Nature is wiser. It provides lessons to men. Nature is eternal, and so its lessons are the same whether the men are young or old, whether they have good fortune or bad. 
the lesson of nature is ever and at all times and eternally the same, yet paradoxically never the same, but always new, always renewed. Renewed, that is, by the endless cycles of decay and growth. The needles of the pine grow and fall. The oak yields acorns. The maples are maturing. And yet at all times, the plants underfoot bud and root. One of the central sentences that sums up the qualities of nature is... What is called fortune and what is called time by men, ye know them not. Because Emerson has already directly described good fortune or bad, time, that is youth and age, in human lifespans, which are quite different from the eternal life of the forest. And that is why humans lack the language to describe our or their moments in that eternal life. That is, the encounters, the momentary encounters that humans have with the forest. Humans emerge from those encounters with language that can only be inadequate to describe them. In the text's latter half, Emerson is deliberately attentive to those inadequacies of human language, what men call fortune and call time, is in insufficient language. Insufficient, that is, compared to the songs or the tunes, as he calls them, of nature, of winds or rains or brooks or birds, all of these sources of forest music. And it is Emerson's emphasis on the musicality, on the songs of men and of nature that is, for me, the most compelling evidence, or rather argument, that this text deserves to be considered and understood as a sonnet. When it was invented way back in the 13th century and then adapted and expanded first by Dante and then by Petrarch, the sonnet always meant a little song or sonetto. These are the songs of men that Emerson is referring to. Songs in a beautiful, yes, but also inadequate language that is often repeated and thus they grow old, both with time and with familiarity. So many of those sonnets are about the subject of love. That was, of course, the original subject of them in the, in the Italian tradition. And while love itself renews and varies with each possessor, each expressor, it's also true that sonnets about love are themselves the same, even if love itself is not. Whereas no two encounters with nature will ever be the same. And that, I think, for me at least, begins to justify why this prose text is sonnet-like. Insofar as it is one incomplete localized encounter with a theme or source of inspiration or an idea that the poet acknowledges, recognizes, and humbly draws upon as the limitless source of this limited song.